Our next speaker is Benedetto Baron. He's a research oceanographer in the Department of Oceanography. He has a PhD in marine sciences and engineering from the University of Naples. I looked it up. The University of Naples founded in the year 1224. It's just really astonishing stuff. He arrived in UH as a postdoc in 2012 where he started using optical instruments to measure the ecological characteristics of the ocean, open ocean. He has an interest in using AUVs to measure the variability of plankton communities with a focus on mesoscale variability. Benedicto. Uh, thanks for the invitation. Uh, no, no, any, there won't be metazoans in these talks, but well, there's robots, so I hope you're happy. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm going to describe the horizontal variability of uh, marine ecosystems uh, as measured with uh, autonomous vehicles. Uh, I had to cut the second part of the talk for, for sake of uh, brevity, but uh, luckily Angel covered it. Um, so uh, I hope this can be more interesting. So when I said horizontal variability, probably most of you uh, thought, OK, yeah, but we know a lot from uh, satellites. Uh, we have so many images that we can retrieve. And in this case, I'm showing you exactly that. Some of the most useful information that comes from satellite for us could be the chlorophyll concentration that is the main proxy for phytoplankton biomass. And also something else, the currents. So we have daily reconstruction of the surface currents from the geostrophic field. Uh, that you can see here uh, depicted as arrows, uh, if you can see them. So the, the color here is chlorophyll, the arrows are currents. And from this information that we get daily, we can see how uh, there is a lot of horizontal variability at the surface and is structured partly by these motions. And in particular, the scales that I'm interested in are these mesoscale and sub-mesoscale motions that are approximately from one kilometer to uh, several hundreds kilometers. And they are interesting mostly because they contain most of the kinetic energy of the ocean currents, but also because at the sub scale in particular, we have these localized upwelling and downwelling that are important for the uh, nutrient cycling in this ecosystem. But so, yeah, I'm showing you this, but I'm really not a surface guy, uh, as Angel declared she was. I'm more of a subsurface enthusiast. And there's uh, a reason for that. And the reason is that in this ecosystem, um, in most of the North Pacific subtropical gyre, uh, the largest concentration of chlorophyll is not at the surface, but it's deep down in this layer that we call the deep chlorophyll maximum. And uh, despite not being the place where most of the photosynthesis takes place, it's a very important uh, place for the um, cycling of growth limiting nutrients like nitrogen, because you have this deep nutrient reservoir that diffuses upward and is assimilated by the community that is in this layer. So even for climatic budgets, this is a very important layer. And that's why I think it's worth focusing on it. But we cannot use satellites. We need to use something else. Ships are there. They are expensive. But we can use autonomous underwater vehicles. And that's what I'm going to talk about. So with Dave, um, Steve, Polos, Dave, Carl, we have, uh, we have been using several underwater vehicles. Um, I'm showing you three of them, sea gliders, wire walkers, and wave gliders. But really, I don't have time for most of it, so I'm, I'm going to focus on the sea gliders. These uh, vehicles that go up and down in the water, you can pilot them in the direction you want. They can go at a velocity of about uh, 20 kilometers per day, horizontally. They can dive as deep as 1,000 meters. Uh, with a resolution of about a few hours, meaning the distance, temporal distance between profiles. Uh, they can stay in the water for months, and they not only measure the physical characteristics of the water, so salinity, temperature, but also optical proxy of the status of the ecosystem as particle concentration, chlorophyll from fluorescence, uh, oxygen, and the color of dissolved organic matter. So we have a lot of data that we can collect, but how we, do we study the horizontal variability from these measurements. Well, arguably, the best way to do that, if we can go back to that map we had before, is to go orthogonal to the surface currents. And this would maximize the variability that we see in the horizontal space. Uh, so that's how we piloted um, 
sea gliders. And I will give you three examples of what we uh, did and three kinds of dynamics that we observed. But notice here in this map that a lot of the currents are structured around these circles. And many of you will know that these circles are uh, mesoscale eddies. So they are these closed circulation features that are very prevalent in the ocean. And so my first example would be uh, about these mesoscale eddies. Uh, in particular, I'm giving you like a very short introduction for those of you who don't know this about mesoscale eddies. There's two main kinds, there are subkinds, but the main kinds are two, anticyclonic and cyclonic. For the northern hemisphere, the anticyclonic have a, a clockwise circulation. They have a sea surface that is elevated with uh, respect to neutral condition. And they have that uh, deep layers of water are pushed deeper down in the water column with clear implications for the uh, cycling of this deep nutrient reservoir. And the opposite takes place in a cyclone. So our first example is really, let's take a glider and go across two eddies of different polarity and see what's the difference between the two. And that's what we did in, uh, this is an example for, from 2016. Uh, what I'm showing in this map that is north of Hawaii is the height of the sea surface. So the red region has elevated sea surface, the blue region a depressed sea surface. So this is a cyclone and this is an anticyclone. And this dashed line is the trajectory of the glider uh, sampling across these uh, eddies. And it's very interesting what we measured. Um, these are contour plots. I'm just going to introduce them because there's a couple more later. On the y-axis, I would have depth. On the x-axis is the distance along this transect. In this case, the anticyclone is on the left-hand side, and the cyclone is on the right-hand side. And we have chlorophyll and the anomaly of the oxygen concentration on certain layers. So you see that when you transition in the cyclone, you have an increase in the chlorophyll concentration at the deep chlorophyll maximum, not much variation in the surface. And uh, this is a log scale on the, uh, for the chlorophyll. And so this uh, uplifting of deep water uh, stimulates this community. And we know that this community has also produced more, photosynthesized more, because there has been a buildup of oxygen in the same layer. So in cyclonic eddies, there is this stimulation of the phytoplankton community that takes place and is measurable with autonomous vehicles. The second example is still about eddies. This is an anticyclone that we uh, explored uh, on its southern edge. So this is the anticyclone in this case from 2015. And this is the uh, transect that I'm showing you. Uh, and we characterize the southern edge of the anticyclone. In this case, we saw something that it was uh, unexpected. And we had to discuss what we were seeing uh, because in this transect where the edge of the uh, anticyclone is here and the center is here, the oxygen concentration showed these clear uh, tilted plumes of uh, positive oxygen concentration that propagated with a tilt towards uh, the deep layer had a tilt towards the center of the anticyclone. We originally thought, well, maybe this is something related to the biology, less consumption of oxygen or, or more production of oxygen. Uh, but then we saw that the anomaly of the salinity in these same filaments was uh, positive and very recognizable. And this uh, tilt was also consistent with this phenomenon called mesoscale steering, whereby this uh, different water gets entrained in the anticyclonic circulation and transport uh, hundreds of kilometers away waters with very um, distinct characteristics. And we see it in the biogeochemistry, but it's likely that also the communities were very different. Uh, so they, these different communities are transported and keep their characteristics for hundreds of kilometers apart. The third example that I have is uh, about exploring fronts that is pretty popular right now, the sub mesoscale frontal dynamics. We can identify fronts with uh, different proxies from satellite. One proxy is to look at the thermal gradients so how much temperature changes over uh, space at the sea surface. So in, in 2017, we, we saw this uh, big and strong front. We had a glider in the water, and we said, OK, let's try to cross it. Uh, and that's the uh, trajectory of the glider that uh, did this crossing, actually. Um, and it's very interesting what we saw. So um, 
In this case, I'm showing you two contours for the upper 200 meters. There's a time on the x-axis, but it's the analog analogous as uh, uh, distance along the transect. Uh, and we have salinity on the top plot and chlorophyll on the bottom one. So you can see that towards the end of this transect, we cross this very strong front. This red line is an isopycnal, so meaning that there is a big change in density. This is a very energetic front. Uh, and you can imagine that the position of the front is uh, approximately this red line. And from the chlorophyll, you can see that on the light side, where there's less dense water, you had a strong uh, increase in uh, phytoplankton on that side. And uh, that's probably a reason why. And the reason has been described in the literature. Uh, this is, a, I'm taking it from uh, a review by Mahadevan uh, from 2016. So if this is the front, when it intensifies, you expect that there to be upwelling on the light side and downwelling on the uh, dense side. And if we bring these uh, arrows to the previous contour, uh, you can see that this is consistent with what we see. So if here we have upwelling, we are bringing up these uh, deep nutrients on this side of the front and stimulating the phytoplankton community, whereas the same doesn't happen uh, on the other side. Actually, you have downwelling, so you somehow depress the, the phytoplankton community on that side. So in conclusion, what I showed you is that with the sea gliders, we observed several flavors of variability horizontal variability, specifically in, in the subsurface, where this variability is more hidden from uh, our site. And the first of these variations is this um, stimulation of the phytoplankton community in the deep chlorophyll maximum of a cyclone. The second one was uh, this mesoscale steering, so that the anticyclonic circulation entrains these uh, water masses with different um, properties and uh, likely community and transport them uh, for uh, hundreds of kilometers. And the third one is this sub-mesoscale upwelling where you have the this stimulation of the community specifically on the light side of a front for this uh, upwelling. And well, I, I have to thank a lot of people and acknowledge a lot of people for this talk. I will mention Dave Carl and Steve Polos, but also um, the funding agencies and in particular the Simons Foundation. Thank you. Any questions? Well, uh, we just uh, crossed it once, I think, or uh, twice, actually, and it was still there on the way back. Uh, but it was the distance of the two crossings with the sea glider of the front was, I think, one or two days. Uh, we don't have a big statistic. I think, in general, uh, we were kind of lucky to sample that event that it's, I, I haven't seen it much in the literature, uh, observations on that, uh, but also because these levels of uh, gradients in, th in temperature and in density are kind of anomalous. You don't see them often. Right. So I would say that I don't have a statistics right now to give you an answer. The literature says it's the order of days, probably even hours sometimes. I don't know how long the chlorophyll signal will stay there. Uh, but the growth rate of plankton and the mortality are similar and around one per day, one division per day. So you would expect that the community actually respond so fast to erase the signal pretty fast. Yeah, because I mean, the eddies just hang around for a long time. On the eddies, is a different story. This, yeah. I, I was talking about the front. And the eddies, we, we can see, I think we have now several observations of the same amplification of the chlorophyll maximum. And you shouldn't think, at least my idea is that you shouldn't think about it in the site on upwelling, because these are stable features. You sh should think more, my idea is that you take a bite of this nutric line, and you're stuck with steeper gradients, so meaning uh, larger uh, diffusions of nutrients that sustain a, a larger community. Yeah. 
Okay, thanks.